good evening, everybody, and thank you for your time tonight. And I want to extend a warm welcome and thank you to Dr. Nicholas Widmer for his time this evening. I know that you're very busy. We do have a wonderful webinar for you this evening on socket grafting, uh, which will be with a presentation and a little hands-on demonstration. We will do a live Q&A session at the end. Um, if your question doesn't get answered, uh, please know that I will be sending the unanswered questions over to Dr. Nicholas to uh, get the answers. So everybody will be answered uh, and that will be fine. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to you, Dr. Nicholas. And uh, if you want to share your screen, then you can take over. Good evening, everybody. Um... Before I start, welcome in Bern. Uh, it's not an actual picture. We already have a little bit winter, less leaves. But before I start, I want to thank you, Ashley, and the organization team in Australia, uh, Peter Wheeler, Joe Heisen, and Peter Furban. Um, this is my office. I'm a general practitioner. It's a part of my staff. So I am made some... Uh, postdoc uh, formation, but I am not um, an oral surgeon, so please be kind with me. So the topic uh, for today is uh, socket grafting with ethos. And uh, I will talk a little bit um, when and why we do socket craft, about bone resorption, and then some advantage, disadvantages of the different techniques like immediate implant placement, early or socket graft. Then the decision tree, just I do it in my office, doesn't mean it's the only or right way. And then how to do socket graft, some discussion about the materials, xenograft versus synthetic, and a step-by-step -step demonstration and then we will have some time for questions and answers. So why and when socket craft? Let's start with the topic of bone resorption. Just the definition, when we extracted the tools, we have different options. We can do a late implant placement. That means maybe after some months, or we can do early, maybe after some weeks. But we can also do an immediate implant placement or a socket craft. So um, the traditional way, if we wait a little bit, maybe after six weeks, especially in the anterior area, we already can see some change after extraction. We can uh, observe a decrease in bone width, but also in bone height. And uh, even very often uh, a soft tissue collapse. So this can happen uh, very fast. But they are not only negative things if we wait some weeks, there are also good things happening. The healing is in progress. So normally after four to six weeks, we already have a fully closed soft tissue. In, but we can see uh, some partial absorption of the alveolar bone on the crest. But uh, deep in the alveolus, uh, there is starting formation of woman bone. If we wait longer, months or years, then there is even more resorption, or we can call it bone remodeling. Um, and uh, the, the bone is basically shrinking, but the alveolus is, after some months, often uh, filled up with new bone formation, depending on the geometry of the defect and other factors. So bone resorption is something we don't want to have. And there's the question, how can we preserve um, bone uh, resorption after extraction? And there are different concepts and ideas. So one way is the socket graft, and another technique is the immediate implant placement. So I would like to talk a little bit about these different techniques and advantages and disadvantages. <clears throat> um, 
when um, uh, immediate implant placement became popular maybe about 20 years ago there was a big uh, boom in switzerland um, it was something very new and uh, noble biocare really pushed it hard and uh, then after some years we also have seen problems but this time uh, we were thinking an implant behaves similar like a tooth that when we extract the root we can place an implant and just by placing the implant the the bone is going to be stabilized but this is not so easy um, the problem is speci especially in the anterior region the so-called thin bundle bone um, the bundle bone um, doesn't have a lot of cancellous bone it's mainly cortical bone so the vascularization is not so much by internal blood, blood vessels but more by the periosteum and the periodontium by the existing root so when we um, remove the root then we also remove a big part of the vascularization and when this bundle bone is really thin, um, then it's uh, going to uh, uh, resorb because of uh, avascular necrosis. So it ne needs to be quite thick, 1.5 millimeters. And uh, as we clinicians, we know this is very seldom the case uh, in anterior region. So very often we will see a bone resorption of the bundle bone. And this was the problem when we started with uh, immediate placed implants about uh, 20 years ago, that we uh, placed a large implant that was in contact with the bundle bone. But because we lost uh, blood supply, very often uh, we ended up in a recession. So um, immediate implant placement uh, became a bad reputation, at least in Switzerland, also pushed by other companies. And, uh, but we still have done this, but that doesn't mean it's a bad technique. It just has to be um, adapted. Um, so the implant itself cannot prevent the bone absorption. But the implant, as it is, of course, an osteoconductive surface, it can help supporting bone substitutes or also autologous bone. And uh, we just have to adapt our technique. We should not place that wide uh, diameter implants that are in direct contact with the buccal bone. We should use uh, such... Um, thinner implants and leave a gap between the implant and the buccal bone. Uh, the, the gap should be um, at least 1.5 millimeters. When we have less than 1.5, then it will probably fill uh, just the blood clot will transform and we call this a jumping distance. But I think even then it's better to um, um, to graft this space because um, 1.5 millimeter it's not so much. Uh, so in this case, when we graft um, between the implant and the bundle bone, even then the thin bundle bone will probably resorb, but uh, the bundle bone acts like a resorbable membrane. The same thing is true for a soccer craft, which we will speak a little bit later. So um, 1.8 millimeter is better than 1.5, of course, but it depends on uh, different uh, clinical situations. So um, immediate implant placement has a lot of uh, advantages. It is less surgery. It is a shorter treatment time. It's better patient compliance. It's also probably more profitable for us as doctors. But the biggest advantage now when we have uh, some experience and uh, adapted our technique 
is, in my opinion, the immediate temporary restoration. It doesn't mean that it has to be a crown, but at least an immediate uh, healing apartment and even better, a customized healing apartment. So uh, this can be done with a temporary apartment and composite, or some companies deliver uh, some pre-shaped uh, that is easily to adapt, like here, this uh, uh, peak uh, healing apartment uh, from Austin Company. But um, immediate implant placement is not always the best solution. We have to check some clinical uh, um, uh, things and we have to consider the presence or absence of infection, the amount of uh, remaining alveolar bone, and uh, the uh, anatomical structures. So when we have an acute um, uh, uh, infection, that means uh, uh, um, separation or pain, then I think it's better not to place an implant immediately. I know there are some studies it works, but it is also, at least in Switzerland, a legal thing. If it doesn't work, then maybe you can get into some problems. Um, also, what is important is the quality and quantity of soft tissue. Uh, today, we know we uh, should place often implants uh, subcrestally. Uh, even these implants are called bone level, it's actually subcrestal level implants. Um, and uh, everybody who placing implants probably made the experience like in the uh, anterior lower jaw, which is often very uh, delicate, that when we do not place the implant deep, deep enough, we get a lot of troubles. You can see here just uh, some x-rays, a case that was sent by me from a colleague. He placed the immediate implants, but just uh, on the level of the crest, and there is a lot of uh, resorption. Um, different reason, bundle bone, thin, uh, uh, tissue, soft tissue, and so on. Um, but we should place the implant at least uh, four millimeters, the, the implant shoulder from the uh, free gingival margin at least four millimeter in distance. Okay, what we also have to consider when we do uh, immediate implant placement is the uh, remaining alveolar bone apical to the alveolus. So normally with most uh, implants that are conical shaped, in many cases, we should not get the primary stability um, in the, um, on the side laterally, because then we go too close to the buccal bone, but we should get primary stability in the apical part. So to get us, we need enough bone, maybe at least three millimeters up to critical uh, anatomical structures, such like the nasal floor or the um, uh, uh, nervous alveolus inferior. Here you can see this in this slide. So we need some security margin. Okay, but uh, still many indications for immediate implant placement. There should be no acute infection. Uh, the one wall should remain. We should have sufficient bone apically um, and uh, sufficient uh, width of bone. And maybe favorable soft tissue conditions. But um, in some areas, uh, immediate implant placement has a bad reputation. And uh, the mistakes I personally made uh, quite a lot. I did not place the implant deep enough. And I placed maybe the implants where the bone is and not so much uh, prosthetically driven. And I did wrong suturing technique. I did not immediate uh, customized healing apartment. And uh, I tried to close the flap and I lost keratinized tissue that are probably the most uh, frequent mistakes when doing uh, immediate implant placement. 
So like in this case, I extracted all the T's, just remained the last molars for uh, provisional. And then I placed um, six, uh, six implants. And the implant in the region of the central incisor was not placed deep enough. And there was some pressure of the removable provisional prosthesis. So this implant uh, get lost. By example, or here another uh, mistakes I made quite often. I extracted the molar and I placed the implant in the distal um, uh, root alveolus and not in the septum. So uh, the shape of the crown um, is compromised. Uh, there is um, often food impaction. And one of the biggest problems, in my opinion, is the carriers, the decay on neighboring teeth on implants. I, I could show you at least 100 cases from my office where patients only have carriers uh, in neighbor tooth to implants. And uh, this is uh, something that are not already a lot of research and uh, the implant is maybe fine, it's a success, but when you ask the patient, do you have a food impaction around the implant, maybe in 70% of the cases is food impaction. And this is uh, of different reason, but one is uh, the wrong position of the implant. So you can look like in this picture, you can see an old lady or a young lady. You can say it's the uh, mistake of the patient, he did not brush, or you can say it's the mistake of the dentist like me who placed the implant in the wrong position. Okay, but anyway, I think the educational opinion is going to change uh, because also big uh, implant companies are now not only offering uh, parallel implants, but more tapered or more aggressive threads that are more um, or better for immediate implant placement. Okay, but immediate implant placement is often not the easiest case. It's a technique you have to study a little bit about. And I can highly recommend you, if you are interested, the webinar from Dr. Costa Nicolopoulos. You can also find it on the ETHOS uh, homepage or a little a more detailed, uh, like uh, eight hours lectures from Do Professor Thomas Linkevich's. Uh, it's really excellent uh, concept about the uh, uh, zero bone loss concept and also immediate implant placement. But that is not the main topic. So another good technique is we wait a little bit, we do early implant placement. When we wait at just four or six weeks, normally if we had any infection, the infection is normally gone and the soft tissue is closed. And this procedure is maybe a little bit easier, a little bit less risky. But we already can observe uh, some bone loss and of, often also some uh, uh, tissue, soft tissue collapse. And it is one more surgery. But anyway, this is the protocol uh, for ETHOS published by Dr. Peter Furban and Dr. Minas Levantis. And I have done it uh, many hundreds of time and I can honestly tell you it works very well, very little problems. You can find, I think, this protocol also on the homepage. So this is the, um, in the straightforward cases, the timetable, extraction is done, uh, then uh, implant placement is maybe four to six weeks after extraction, often grafted with ethos, almost not in all cases, but maybe 70% of the cases I use a graft. And then second stage is 10 up to 12 weeks after implant placement and impression taking maybe one, two weeks after um, second stage and then crown delivery. So this is the normal timetable uh, for early implant placement. Soccer graft is another great option, but when uh, we should use a soccer graft, 
I personally do it when I cannot, I think it's not a good indication for immediate or early implant placement. And this is the case when I think I cannot achieve a good primary stability or the simultaneous bone augmentation would be just too much, too difficult, or I have a bad feeling. When I am very close to an anatomical structures like the nasal floor. And uh, what is important, I only do the soccer graft when there is no acute infection. So I would like to present you the decision tree, how I handle this in uh, my office. Um, it looks a little bit complicated, but it's actually not so. Um, on when already before I extract the tooth, I'm going to think uh, some considerations. I, I'm thinking, will the remaining bone volume allow me to place the implant primary stable? This is uh, first uh, thought. Then second, where can I get the primary stability? Do I have to get it laterally? Do I have enough space laterally or buccally? Or I am getting too close to the buccal bone if there's thin buccal bone. That is better. I can get primary stability in the apical part. And then the third consideration is if I have this bone defect, maybe after extraction, even a little bit more bone defect, can I do an augmentation simultaneously with uh, implant placement, or will this be also too much, too difficult? Uh, we will go through with some examples. So if I think, yes, remaining bone is good, primary stability, yes, is good, and uh, bone augmentation can be done um, also simultaneously, I'm here on the, on the left side, yes, so I can choose like a personal preference if I do um, an immediate implant placement, but only if I have no acute infection and some favorable conditions. When I think, yeah, maybe um, there's an, a small infection, small pain, then I just extract the tooth and I let heal by second intention and then I place an early implant. When I think these three um, um, clinical situations are not given, by example, I do not have enough boil to place the implant primary stable, then we are on the right side of the schema. Um, I again think, do I have an acute infection? If I have acute infection, again, I just extract the tooth, I clean, I rinse, but I let it heal by second intention, and then, of course, I do a bone augmentation. But here comes the part with the soccer craft. When I think, let's say, I'm very close to anatomical structures, but I have uh, no uh, acute uh, infection, no pain, no separation, then I do the socket graft, and then I place the implant delayed maybe 10, 12 weeks after the socket graft. So this is uh, the decision tree. Here, an example, a uh, very easy case, um, a broken first uh, premolar, but no pain, no infection. I extracted the tooth and I placed an implant immediately. But I did not an immediate healing abutment because the angulation of the previous tooth was not um, perfect. So this would not help me. So I let um, I did some bone augmentation and uh, let it heal. Here another case. Um, uh, it's also a broken uh, tooth, a broken root, a root fracture, but there was a separation. So in this case, I don't want to place an implant immediately. But uh, it's still sufficient bone apically to the root 
to place an implant early. I'm, I have a quite a large white bone, so I think it's easy to place an implant. So we are now here in this uh, line. There is uh, some suppuration, so I extract the tooth, I let it heal, and I place the implant early. Uh, this was um, this uh, case here. Um, very important uh, degranulation. Then I uh, place the implant. Of course, there's a buccal defect. You can see I placed the implant quite deep. And then I graft the buccal dehiscence with ethos, but it's still a small bony defect. I can easily do this augmentation together with the implant placement. So the ethos is placed, it is dried with the sterile gauze for maybe three up to four minutes. And uh, then the flap is sutured. So a uh, quite easy, straightforward case. Here I used uh, some uh, Teflon sutures. It's a nice handling, but they are a little bit more costly than nylon sutures. And here, look how nicely the soft tissue looks. This is often a positive side effect with the ethos. And uh, it was placed and uh, screw retained uh, a zirconia crown. And I'm confident that the papilla will grow a little bit uh, apically because we did the polish the zirconia surface without no glazing. Okay. So they are the part of the decision tree. Let's take a look at this clinical case. There is already a good implant in the position of the lateral incisor, but here the canine has a root fracture. I don't have enough bone apically to the root. It's not the sinus. The sinus would be okay, but it's the nasal floor. Then that means I cannot get the primary stability in the apical part, and I also do not want to place a wide implant because with a wide implant, I would get too close to the existing implant. And you know, we should remain a distance of maybe three millimeters. And uh, so there was no acute infection, no pain, no separation. So I decided to do a socket graft in this case. Generally in uh, canines, I don't want to place any more these very long implants. I think uh, 10 or 11.5 millimeter is enough. And often in uh, canine cases with um, short mesiodistal distance, I, I do a socket graft, like here in this case. And then I can place a shorter implant. I, I don't see the advantage of a long implant. When we do soccer craft, one critical um, question is how to stabilize or how to protect the graft. There are different techniques, and I tried out uh, a soft tissue graft, collagen. But uh, for me, what works is uh, the sinus fleece. So that means I do not close uh, primarily. I let granulate, but I think granulation is, uh, is easier with a collagen fleece. So the collagen fleece is something because between a spong and the collagen membrane. It uh, has, a, in my opinion, very good uh, granulation. And I use a special suture technique, will, which I will show you in the demonstration soon. Then what you put over this, and also I tried out uh, different uh, materials. The aura ed is a resorbable uh, kind of a membrane or a blister. Then um, what I use often is the 
in this space, the sole cause of rule. I don't know if you can get it in Australia. Sometimes it's also difficult to get in Switzerland. When I don't get it, I did my own product with, uh, with a pharmacy and uh, it was this, I called it Biobaco gel because we have a lot of patients uh, which are thinking in a holistic way in Switzerland. So the name was kind of a marketing, but anyway, it contains um, etheric oils and uh, hyaluronic acid to fasten the epithelialization. And there's the Blue M gel and uh, many other options. Um, some informations about this uh, gel I use, it's uh, made of uh, blood. Um, so there are some considerations, but uh, it's a great product. Um, so here case, I did socket graft. Um, I just went through some cases uh, yesterday evening. I found this nice result, but honestly, I don't remember why I did the socket graft. I think it was a busy patient and he, he, he went away for some months. But I did it with this protocol. I grafted with Vitos. I placed the sinus fleece. I did the hidden egg suture and the good result. But uh, for me, it's a bigger pleasure when uh, colleagues are also using this technique it, when it doesn't work only in my hands. And this is a doctor colleague from, from Bern as well. He just sent me yesterday uh, by WhatsApp uh, this X-ray. So um, there was the remaining root of the lower premolar, but you can see the root tip is very close to the nerve. So he decided better not to place an implant immediately, but he made a socket graft and he used the same technique. He grafted with ethos. He used a, a fleece and the egg suture, nice granulation and nice result after about the 10 to 12 weeks, ready to place the implant. Okay, um, then there is also um, sometimes an acute infection. Let's go back to the decision tree with a separation, but it's not enough bone to place an implant. Of course, this happens. So this was a, um, a little bit more of a complex clinical case. The patient had... Uh, um, a defect, it was already a cyst on the central and lateral incisor. So first was just to extract the teeth, to degranulate, clean and do nothing. And this is also the sinus fleece and some holding sutures. But then the bone augmentation was done uh, about, um, I think, six weeks after the extraction uh, and the cleaning of the site. Now it was done uh, the standard procedure. Uh, anyway, I built up the bone with ethos and then uh, I placed the implant delayed. That means about uh, three months after the grafting of ethos. I think it would take too much time to uh, see this case. So just some pictures of another case, a uh, um, patient with uh, payer problems. There was a defect up to the root tip. So I extracted the tooth and the patient went through um, a dental hygienist and so on for about uh, three, four months. And then uh, was a clean situation and then I uh, placed uh, the implant delayed. I made a papilla preservation flap. Uh, there was, of course, a lot of bone loss. I did a grafting with ethos and the same procedure, suturing. And there was a nice result. I even get too much bone. And if you look at the picture with the nice soft tissue, it's only one surgery. And this is big advantage with ethos, the nice soft tissue response. 
So the secret here in these cases is to stabilize somehow the ethos graft. And one option is to use a high cover screw. You can see in the middle X-ray, um, the cover screw is about two millimeter height, and this is working like a tenting pole for and uh, protecting the graft. Okay, so how to do a socket graft? Some words about xenograft versus synthetic, and then we go uh, to the last part to the short demonstration. Um, in Switzerland, uh, you know, we have companies like Geistlich and Straumann, so we use a lot of bovine hydroxyapatite. It's not a bad material, it has uh, many advantages, it has a high volume stability. This advantage is slow or maybe even not resorbable. The bone quality is, uh, I think, not the best because it's always still uh, a mixture. It's not 100% uh, true bone. Uh, the bone implant contact can be reduced and the bone growth is rather, rather slowly compared to, uh, to other grafts. And there is this discussion with the BEC, even also Geistlich, I think they use the cows from Australia because you don't have any problems with BEC. Um, what is the most used uh, bone augmentation material worldwide? It is uh, TCP uh, because of the medicine, not of dentistry. It is uh, osteoconductive, maybe also osteoinductive. Some studies uh, show this. And uh, there is, of course, no risk of infection. So there are advantages. But some uh, clinical outcome is considered to be unpredictable. And I will explain you why. It's uh, how to do the technique. But um, because the material resorb, we get um, really new bone. And this was a study uh, comparing these different materials. And with the uh, TCP, uh, there was get uh, uh, the fastest and the highest turnover in, uh, in real bone. So other material uh, sometimes used is calcium sulfate. It's gypsum, actually use it in, in reconstruction. Um, it's in situ hardening, but uh, is a very fast resorption. This material is already used over 100 years in bone augmentation because of its um, aseptic um, behavior. So if we summarize, um, there are some products, they have a very good volume stability, like hydroxyapatite, then on the on the on the opposite is material that resorbs very fast, like is calcium sulfate, and the ideal uh, bone uh, substitute material would be high volume stability, but also high resorption, which is difficult to get all together. But um, high resorption means also high regeneration, like the TCP. So. Uh, Let's come close to ethos. I think the genius part of Dr. Furban was mixing the three calcium phosphate with the calcium sulfate. So it's a mix uh, 65% to 35%. And as the calcium sulfate gives uh, initial stability, a membrane is not needed. But also the calcium sulfate is going to resorb very quickly and it leaves space for the vessels to uh, grow in. That is the, the, the genius part. And in many histolog histological research, we can see very fast uh, bone growths. 50% of new bone compared to xenograft is maybe 13% after, after 12 weeks. So really uh, nice material. And now I would like to show you uh, the last part, uh, a, a short um, clinical demonstration. Just here, a picture of uh, chili con carne. And uh, that is not good when your Ito soccer craft looks like that. You should uh, not um, craft and push too long. 
Otherwise, uh, the bone will start bleeding and you will not get a setting of the material. This is important, first. And second, um, uh, uh, you can see here in the, in the x-ray, uh, a nice case, but the difficult part is to get the material in contact with the bone in the most apical part of the alveolus. So these are the two difficulties when we deal uh, socket graft with ethos. Okay. So I can show you, I have my mannequin, the materials I use are here and I will uh, show you quickly. So after extraction, uh, cleaning of the site is, uh, is mandatory. You can use uh, curettes. They are um, also some serrated products can be helpful, but a good, good cleaning is very important. And if I can give you a clinical tip, we always um, do movement like this, but often pushing is better and then take out. It's easier to remove the remaining granulation tissue. And then uh, what works very well is the um, degranulation kit is from Strauss. They are uh, basically very big diamond burrs and uh, they clean very efficient. So I use them um, first in very low speed without water uh, and softly touching uh, the bone. And then for the uh, rinsing effect, I use it with a sterile saline and uh, a little bit faster, but uh, not, not uh, with uh, big pressure. Uh, talking about um, the solution effect, I think this is very important. I do not have 100% success with uh, soccer craft. And uh, it happens that uh, the ethos get washed out. It is rare but it happened. So I asked myself, why was this? It could be that there was internal, that uh, like an infection and uh, the material is pushed out or maybe I lost the collagen fleece. So to eliminate, el eliminate the infection, degeneration is very important. And also what is, uh, underestimated is the rinsing. Rinsing is, uh, is the solution, I think. And I really rinse a lot. So I use a full uh, marmalade glass of uh, uh, solution. And I have here this uh, syringe I can easily load up. And I really, really uh, rinse a lot. Um, so the solution against pollution is the solution. And sometimes I even rinse with uh, betadine. But betadine works better when it's uh, placed in the alveolar for some minutes. So I soak a gauze with betadine and then I uh, place uh, the gauze in the alveolus and I leave it for two, three minutes. Okay, this was the cleaning. Now, um, Let's uh, put the ethos uh, in. And for this purpose, I do not mix the ethos in the syringe because it's often uh, too big, the syringe. So I, I mix it in a sterile uh, dappen. And I first use just a small part. Uh, easiest way to um, do is it like uh, tapping with an instrument. I can uh, better control uh, the amount. So I use just a little bit of ethos and then I mix it with the sterile saline. Then often it is either not enough or it is too much of saline happens. I think this is already 
a little bit too much and it's going to be too liquid. It's good when the mixture is liquid for the first um, um, portion to get in contact with the apical bone, but this is maybe a little bit too liquid. So I can use the sterile gauze and uh, um, uh, soak some, some water. And then how to get it to the apical part. First, it's important to control the bleeding. Also to control the bleeding, I use the sterile gauze and I push it in the alveol and leave it for a minute. If there's still bleeding, I, I use cyclocapron. I soak the gauze in cyclocapron and leave it for another one, two minutes. Okay. Now, especially in the upper jaw, sometimes it's difficult to get the material in. So what I use is either this tool, it's uh, from Cascade, from Ostem, it works very well, or a bone carrier like this. Both uh, work well in small spaces. So I uh, load the material like this uh, in this uh, carrier. Okay. I hope you can see this. And then, as I already have these instruments, I use it, but of course, there are other options. So I can really uh, place it on the end of the alveoles. But what I now not should do is to do too many movements, otherwise you get the chili con carne. You can dry again a little bit, use the gauze, and if you have bleeding, I use the small suction. It's also part of the degranulation kit, and I remove blood through the gauze, not the, the syringe is um, the suction tip is not in direct contact with the ethos. It's protected by the gauze. Okay. So now I have in the apical part, I have placed uh, my ethos. And then for the upper part, I do um, a dryer mix. And this I can now mix directly in the syringe. I use um, a sterile saline. I mix it and then I push out the water against the stale gauze and I push quite strong here, quite strong. And then it gets the, the dry consistency. And then I can place it and uh, use um, any kind of uh, bone, bone plugger to adapt the material. Uh, can use again the sterile goals to press a little bit more. Okay, it's still missing a little bit material, but do not overgraft that is not good okay i use a little bit more i think it is uh, good now should be enough yeah and then i have to uh, dry um, the ethos for about um, three to four minutes in the meantime, I prepare uh, my assistant. She's holding the course, and I prepare the materials for um, protecting the graft. Hmm. So, what I not doing, I do not try to close here. Uh, Primarily, 
I let it granulate. This way, I will not lose keratinized tissue. But if I would leave it just like that, is a risk that um, it will be washed out. So I use this material. It's a collagen fleece. It's the Sinus fleece, but uh, there are other products, doesn't matter so much. And I cut an uh, appropriate size. Maybe like this, it's uh, still a little bit too big. And sometimes I use it in a double layer like this. Okay, I think it's uh, it's too big. Okay. Now to place it, often even after extraction, it is done, but I try to create here just a little bit space uh, for the collagen fleece. Just like this. And then I place uh, my collagen fleece. And then I try to push it a little bit under the gun. That's why you should loosen the gum a little bit. It's not a it's not a flap, it's just a little bit. Okay. And now you can see also why it's not good if you use the uh, too much uh, of ethos. Okay. So the collagen fleece looks like this. And now I'm going to suture. I use a, a 5 0 suture. This is a nylon suture. I think it doesn't matter so much. But I do a cross suture, but I do it a little bit different. And I show you how I do it. I start the first um, bite where I want to place my knot later. So let's say I want to have my knot here. I go in maybe two, three millimeter distance, and then uh, to not cut the, the sinus fleece, I protect the sinus fleece with an instrument, the collagen fleece, okay? So like this, then I go cross, I can again protect, And now I'm going back again from buckle side. This is a little bit different. It's called hidden X suture, by the way. So I protect again. And the last stitch, protect my collagen fleece. Oops. Okay. Looks like this. Now I'm doing uh, the knot.
Okay. So what is the advantage of this suture? There are two advantages. First, you can see the cross is lying directly on top of the collagen fleece and it's better protecting. And the second advantage, when I tie the knot, you can see I tie a lot. There is no tightening of the flap in buckle oral direction but the tightening the force is in mesiodistal direction so this way i'm not moving my keratinized tissue palatally and i do not lose the pal the keratinized tissue that is the idea then after that i uh, check if i think it's critical there is something risky or it's not well adapted, my collagen fleece, then sometimes I use a histoacryl. It's a tissue glue, but I use only a little bit. Of course, it's not that uh, tissue friendly. So I use uh, very little. I uh, just use an instrument, a little bit glue, and I place it just where I think is the critical part. Just like this, and it will dry within seconds. But these, most cases, I, I don't do it. But what I always do, I use this uh, Solcosaril, and this sticks better when the surface is dry. So I take a Q-tip on one end, I place the Solcosaril, then first I dry the side, and then I immediately turn it. I put it on, and then very important, I uh, use uh, a lot of water and then you can adapt um, the sulcosaril to the right shape. And that's it. I show this the patient in the mirror and I give very strict and clear instructions for the patient. That is, I think the most cases where I did not have success, it was of course the fault of the patient. No, just joking, but I think instruction is important. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much for your kind attention and please feel free for uh, any questions. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. I love your suture technique. Very, very nice. So we did get a question come through. It was in regards to the implant that you placed quite deep. Um, it said in the video, did you cover the implant with ethos occlusally as well? When I place the implant very deep, then I normally also place a high cover screw. It's two millimeters over the implant shoulder. And then normally I do not cover with ethos. But intentionally it happens. And very often then in these cases, in the second stage, I, I have to take a burr and remove the bone. We'll leave it at that for this evening. Thank you so much for your time. Um, Ethos is available for purchase through our distributors, through Arc Health, through MediDent, through City Dental and through VP Dental. Again, I'd like to thank you for your time and we would love to have you back again sometime. That was great. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Just one last word. Very often we get asked, um, should we mix ATOS with uh, other stuff like blood or PRF? And I don't have experience with PRF, but just let me explain like this. I think Nutella is really good. And also I like guacamole. 
they are both good things, but together it doesn't fit. Okay. <laughs> well Thank you said. Very much. We'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Good evening. Thank you. Bye.